The kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent bear it away. The book of Esther has been used by all kinds of people for all kinds of political, cultural, and spiritual reasons. Esther was a popular subject of artworks in the medieval times. Her story also served as inspiration for Shakespeare's play, Henry VIII. At the time of the Reformation, Protestants and Catholics used the story of Esther to accuse each other of being wicked Hamans and enemies of God's people and to depict themselves as the faithful and righteous Esthers and Mordecais. At the time of the American Revolution, colonists used the story of Esther against King George and the Redcoats, portraying them as the Hamans and the Minions that were against the colonists. But none of those stories hold a candle to the way Jews applied the story at the time of World War II. When the Hamans of Germany targeted the Jews and threatened to kill, destroy, and annihilate them, the Jews turned to the Megillah, the scroll of Esther. And they turned to this story for strength and support. They saw reflections of themselves and the Nazis in the story, and the Nazis knew it, so they banned the book of Esther, especially its use in the concentration camps. In the words of Robert Gordis, in the dark days before their deaths, Jewish inmates of Auschwitz, Dachau, Treblinka, and Bergen-Belsen wrote the book of Esther from memory and read it in secret during the Feast of Purim. Both they and their brutal foes understood its message. The unforgettable book teaches that Jewish resistance to annihilation represents the service of God and devotion to his cause. In the midst of horrific and tragic suffering, the Jews of World War II continued to remember, to recite, and to reflect on the story of Esther. It was as if they were saying to one another, remember, we've been here before. We've suffered before. We've died before. And we've survived before, and we will do so again. They saw in Esther not just past deliverance or future salvation, but present hope of survival. Perhaps not for every single individual, but certainly for the community as a whole. Today, in a time of evangelical deconstruction, And do not let the size of your growing congregation trick you. And in a time of American devolution, and do not let the latest election results deceive you, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent bear it away. As Aragorn once warned Theoden, Open war is upon you whether you risk it or not. And we are engaged in a holy war, a cosmic battle, not for the Constitution of the United States, but for Christ Jesus and his kingdom. Not for comforts and conveniences, but for the cross and the crown of Jesus. Not for our county only, but for every county in this nation. And not for this nation only, but for every nation under heaven throughout the world. The battle for the hearts and souls of God's people rages on wherever image bearers have been taken captive by the devil. Why? Because we have been at war ever since the fall of man in the garden. 
Because God established enmity and animosity between the serpent and the woman and between the serpent's seed and the woman's seed. And the fact of the matter is that neither can live while the other survives. The law cannot be revoked or removed until Jesus Christ comes again. In the meantime, we have been authorized by the king to contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints, to defend the truth of the gospel, to pull down strongholds and cast aside every heretical opinion that opposes the truth of God, and to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ and to proclaim his death until he comes. The king commands us to fight the good fight of the faith against the world, the flesh, and the devil. Not with carnal and material weaponry, but with spiritual weapons in the right hand and the left. Not against other image bearers. Our struggle is against cosmic forces of evil in unseen realms. Not against flesh and blood, neighbors and friends strangers or enemies. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent bear it away. Now all this might come as a surprise to some of you. After all, you know the story, right? Wasn't Haman hanged on a tree? Isn't Haman dead? Didn't Jesus crush the serpent's head on his way out of the tomb? Didn't the dragon already fall from heaven? Didn't Jesus reverse the curse and set us free? Didn't Jesus take what his enemies intended for evil and turn it to good? Yes, to all of the above. So why are we at holy war? Because the crushed serpent and his seed are still dangerous and they are still waging war with us, seeking to kill, destroy, and annihilate the church of Jesus Christ. So as Queen Esther and Mordecai urged the Jews to prepare for conflict and defend themselves against their enemies and foes, So now Christ and the church are just to do the same. Why? Because the Spirit warns us that the same dragon who is furious with the woman, the same dragon who is furious with Mary and the church, is now making war on the rest of her seed, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. We are engaged in holy war with the serpent's seed for the love of the church and for the life of the world. As the British activist and Christian priest Calvin Robinson put it, the true soldier fights not because he hates what is in front of him, but because he loves what is behind him. If you love those who are behind you, your forefathers, your children, your grandchildren, if you love your friends and family, if you care at all about the future or present generations, then you will prepare your minds for active combat and you will prepare your soul for true spiritual warfare. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent bear it away. Our fathers in the faith understood the church in two distinct but related states. The church militant and the church triumphant. The church militant refers to the church on earth, dressed in the armor of God and fighting the good fight of the faith day after day. The church militant refers to the saints in heaven gathered around the throne wearing festal vestments, 
worshiping God with gladness and joy forever and ever. And as much as we look forward to joining the throng of the church triumphant in heaven, we must remember that we are still part of the church militant on earth right here, right now. We live in the crossover of the already not yet. Not yet church triumphant, but we will be church triumphant. Still living as the church militant on earth. And we have our work cut out for us. As Peter Lightheart of the Theopolis Institute predicted, Christians in the United States are entering a period that will lead to martyrdom. He says, perhaps the martyrdom will be comparatively mild as that which is experienced elsewhere. No pyres or firing squads, but only mockery, slander, ostracism. But since martyr means witness, it still will be martyrdom. And that means that it will be an opportunity to witness faithfully under intense cultural pressure. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent bear it away. So as King Saul led the Benjamites to conquer the Agagites and as Queen Esther and Mordecai led the Jews against Haman and his followers, so Jesus leads the church to conquer the enemies of the cross in our time. As Joshua led Israel to conquer all the cities of the land of Canaan, so Jesus leads the church to conquer all the nations of the world with the gospel of God's grace and truth. But how can we cope with such spiritual violence? How can we, who might view ourselves as lovers and not fighters, how can we, in all of our weakness and limitation, conquer sin and death? How can we conquer the world, the flesh, and the devil? How can we conquer even one soul? How can we make a difference in the world against all of these spiritual forces of evil? And as always, the answer is not by flesh, not by might, but by the sword of the Spirit, by the living and active Word of God, by the broken body and blood of the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Like Esther and Mordecai, Christ and the church send her messengers out into every corner of the empire, out into all of the world to deliver the message from the king to all peoples everywhere, but especially to his people. And in these letters, and in these sermons, and in these gatherings, Christ the King gives our marching orders and our moral obligations. Our mission is to proclaim the gospel with our words, with our works, and with our worship to as many as possible. This is our living witness. Our mission is to love as many as possible so that as few as possible will be lost. Our mission is to disciple as many as possible so that as few as possible will be damned. Our mission is to convert as many as possible so that as few as possible will be condemned. Why? Because God has fixed a day at a time unknown to us in which he will come to judge the living and the dead in his son, Jesus. So while people are living their lives as usual, saying peace and prosperity, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, 
It will be as lightning flashing out of a clear blue sky. And they will not escape. At that time, heaven will open and Jesus Christ will come down. And like Mordecai the Jew, he will be mounted and riding on a white and royal horse. The one called faithful and true will come in righteousness. He will judge and make war. His eyes will blaze like a flame of fire. And on his head, he will come wearing the crowns of all his conquered foes. He will bear a secret name unknown to all but himself. He will be clothed in a robe sprinkled and splattered with the blood of his enemies. And the name by which he shall be called is the word of God. The armies of heaven, the angels and the archangels and all the host of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, shall follow him on white horses. And from his mouth, he shall wield a sharp double-edged sword with which to strike down the nations. And he will shepherd the nations with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he will have a name written. King of kings and Lord of lords. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent bear it away. And the king's message to all his enemies and foes is simply this. Repent or perish. Turn away from your sins and take hold of your Savior. Turn away from yourself and lay hold of his salvation. Or else justice will be served and you will get exactly what you deserve, what you've worked for, what you've merited. And you will taste the wrath of the living God. So lay down your weapons. Stop kicking against the goads. Stop putting up resistance. Surrender yourself to the Savior. And instead of being led captive to an execution that would last forever... you'll be set free to march in triumphant procession along with all who have surrendered their lives to the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The king's message to all of his followers is simply this. Stand your ground. Do not flinch in the day of battle. Resist the devil. Put on the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet of hope for salvation. And here's why. Because God has not destined you for wrath, but to obtain salvation through your Lord Jesus Christ, who died for you so that whether you are awake or asleep, you might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up. And in the spirit of doing just that, I want to encourage all you women to consider the Sarahs, Deborahs, Jael's, Bathsheba's, Elizabeth's, Martha's, and Mary's. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Be strong. Be courageous. Be women of virtue. And to all the men, I encourage you to consider the Abels, the Abrahams, the Joshuas, the Calebs, the Davids, the Peters, and Pauls. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Be strong and courageous. 
be men of virtue. And I encourage all, whether men, women, or children, to consider the Lord Jesus Christ, crucified in shame, yet crowned with honor. Consider the outcome of Jesus' way of life and imitate his faith. Walk in his steps. Be a people of virtue. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent bear it away. Now you might feel anxious and afraid about all of this. You might even feel like this is not what you signed up for. It certainly was not mentioned in the membership intro class. You might even imagine that the gospel was simply there to make you healthier and wealthier in some way. Or maybe the gospel was supposed to make you comfy and cozy in this life on this side of heaven. Or maybe it was there to make you clean and sober. And maybe the farthest from your mind was the fact that the gospel was there to make you struggle and suffer and strive. If so, you are not alone. You are not alone in these things. You're not the only one to ever feel that way. Sadly, I must say this, this is the essence of Christianity in suburbia. As the Southern Gothic and Catholic author Flannery O'Connor put it back in the late 1950s, what people don't realize is just how much religion costs. They think faith is a big electric blanket when, of course, it is the cross. But unlike some who have come and gone, we are not the kind of people who shrink back and are destroyed. We're the kind of people who have faith and preserve our souls. Like our mothers, Esther and Mary, we are strong and courageous even in the face of the dragon. We are not victims. We are victors. We are not captives, but more than conquerors through Jesus Christ who loves us. How? Because Jesus, the true and better Mordecai the Jew, is preeminent in all the nations among Jews and Gentiles, but especially with the vast multitude of his brothers and sisters in his church. Because Jesus came and he sought shalom for his people and he spoke peace to all his people. Whether nearby or far away, Christ himself is our peace. And therefore, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Not even dragons or serpents, Haman's dangers, swords, mockery, being ostracized, slandered, hardships, not even death. Because what the God of peace has done for many people in many other times and places, including Mordecai and Esther, including Mary and Jesus, he will do for you. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. And then and only then will there finally be true shalom on earth as it is in heaven. But in the meantime, what are we to do? In the meantime, we gather every week around the Lord's table to celebrate and commemorate Christ's victory over the world, the flesh, and the devil in holy communion. After all, an army marches on his belly. And Christ supplies his church with the very best of provisions. 
He supplies us with nothing less than his own body and blood. And in celebrating and commemorating his victory with gladness and joy, we are also celebrating and commemorating our victory as well. For we are united to Jesus Christ, who is our peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, let us pray. Lord, you are our light and our salvation. Whom shall we fear? You are the stronghold of our life. Of whom shall we be afraid when evildoers assail us to devour our flesh? When dragons and Hamans encircle us, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against us, our hearts shall not fear Though war arises against us, we will be strong and courageous because you are present with us, world without end. So help us wait for the Lord. Strengthen and steady us and let our hearts take courage as we wait for the Lord. And we pray that you will not make us wait too long for we say with all the saints who have come before, Come quickly, Lord Jesus.